and I'll share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Cool. Yes. Great. Okay. All right, so this this lesson here is one I put in only because we had we had a lesson about you know multi-dimensional lists. I was like, you know what? You know, we don't just do like nesting of lists within lists. We do we do all sorts of nesting of data structures. And so I was like, let's do advanced data collection and talk about you know n-dimensional collections. And we're gonna we're gonna go into the third dimension with these collections. We're not gonna go any further, but you can go further. And when you when you talk start talking about machine learning and and other things, you you sometimes have multi-dimensional, you know, going several dimensions deep, uh, whether you have um uh, like satellite imagery or something else, you're looking at different channels, you can start adding dimensions onto these multi-dimensional arrays and they're used uh, for quite a few purposes. And I have a couple listed at the bottom of this lesson. But yeah, so this is the last formal lesson uh, where we're gonna introduce not really new content, but just an expansion on the content you've already learned, uh, really looking into those data collections like lists uh, uh, and and tuples, and then even the, the uh, the um, uh, other data sets like dictionaries and sets, which are unordered. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll start with a little review. So we have our review of lists. Remember, a list is a collection of values that can be you know different different types. So you can have different types of data in the same list. You can have numbers. You can have strings. You can have other lists, uh, and they're ordered. So when you establish a list, or you know you you first set it up. And you put an item in the list, that item is going to stay at that index, you know, in the list. Remember, we access a an item using the indexing, uh, starting at zero when going forward, and then of course starting at negative one when going backwards. We had that graphic uh, in the ordered data structures, also in the strings. Um, let me find it real quick, right here. So we had that indexing starting at zero, going up. And then uh, negative indexing start at the end of a collection. In this case, in the example, I have a string, but this could also apply to a list as well. And then uh, you go backwards. Uh, let me go back. Where did it go? There it is. Okay. Okay. So we have you know my list, and I can I can run this Jupyter notebook here. When I hit play, it's going to prompt me to to select my kernel. I'll go ahead and select that. Now it runs, my list at index zero is one, and then negative one is five, okay? So that's that's a basic one-dimensional list, just a collection of stuff, uh, a collection of items that you can index and it maintains the same order. Um, we touched on two-dimensional lists uh, the last lesson, uh, and you know what it is, the list of lists. And so it's like having rows and columns of data so like a spreadsheet, um, you know, you can think of this as like an Excel spreadsheet or something else. You have your columns up top and then you have your each row, right? And so you could have even like a column header, which would be like, you know, ID and then first name, last name and the other information. And then you can have, you know, the first person and then so on and so forth. Um, and you can, you can still access individual items uh, in this list, but it's it's a bit different, and I, and I think I even mentioned that a bit on the previous lesson as well. So let me instantiate my matrix, or let's put it into memory so we have it. So now I hit play on the Jupyter notebook, and now I get the green check mark, which means that now my matrix is in memory. And if I were to use the bracket index, just like I did here with my index of the index or my list, the index of zero, instead of returning a single item. I'm now going to return a single row of data. So another list with all the items in it, because in my matrix, the first item is this entire list. So if I if I ran here and I go to negative one, I get back seven, eight, nine, because that's the last item in this list. And so all we need to do to drill down, to go into the 
the the actual row is just we need to chain on another bracket to get to that single index. And then we just need to count inside of that, that row what we need to do. So if we need to get to the eight, well, we know we're at, we start counting at zero, so zero, and then um, zero, one, and two. So that's gonna be our first bracket because we're gonna get to that third row. And then I wanna get the second item. We start at zero inside of the row, so zero, one. So it's two and then one. And that's what I have here in this block, my matrix at the index of two, which will give you that row. And then the one, which would give me the item, the second item in that in that uh, list. And so that's that's two dimensional lists. Um, and so that's how you access an item. And you can still use the slicing if you want. You can go in and grab several rows or several items in a row. You can still use that. Um, but also lists in Python are mutable, so we can change them. So we can actually add stuff or change things in place using the assignment operator. Just like we access data, all we need to do is put that assignment operator and then where we want that data to go. In this case, we're saying, hey, in my matrix, in the, in the second row and the second item, because we start at zero indexing, I want to put a 500 there instead. So I'm basically going to go replace this five with a 500. I'm going to run that. And now if you look, I have one, two, three, and then four, and then 500, and six, seven, eight, nine. Any questions on that concept going into two dimensional lists? No, seems understandable. I'm sorry, what? You're pretty quiet. That seems understandable. Okay, awesome. That's great. Um, and we know that lists are iterable, just like you know, basically any other data. We can usually iterate over data structures. We can't iterate over like you know integers, but lists are iterable. It means we can loop over them as they are, and we can loop over you know we can loop over a single list or a one dimensional list by just saying like four item in list or four item in collection, and then print the item. But how can we loop over a two-dimensional list? Well, just like with the indexing, we're just kind of chain on another one. We just chain on our for loop and we just nest it inside. So we have the for loop here, and then we just add another for loop in the second line. We indent because that Python syntax says we have to indent, and we still have another colon, and then we want to print an item. And so here, and I showed this already in the previous lesson, but here we have our um, indexing. We just add a layer to it. And we run it. So here we can say for row in my matrix. And then you're going to use row, this, this temporary variable you assigned on the first, the first outer loop. And you want to start iterating over items in that row. So you're going to use it as your collection in the nested portion. And so now for item and row, we're going to print the item. So I run that. And now we have one, two, three, four, five hundred, six, seven, eight, nine. And so every time this this loop increments. So every time it increments one, this inside loop has to run completely through. So and you know it's going to start with you know at the zero, it's going to it's going to start at row zero and then start at item zero and print out zero and then zero one and then zero two and then that loop's done. Then it goes back up to line one, increments row, so it goes up to one. One zero, one one, one two, and then it goes back up. Two zero, two one, and two two, to get the last one. Any questions on any of this? Okay, well, let's bump it up a dimension. So now we're going to go to three-dimensional lists, okay? So going in dimensions, we just add another layer, okay? At this point, now looking at this, it can be a bit daunting. We're looking at this like, oh my gosh, there's lots of these you know, multi-layers of these square brackets, and I have a bunch of data. And this is, this is really like nothing more than a Rubik's Cube, okay? 
this three-dimensional list. So we have we have just one through 27, uh, and we, we have it oriented in layers, then the rows, then the items themselves. And so when we take a look at this three item list, let me go ahead and, or this three dimensional list, right? I'm gonna go ahead and instantiate into memory so I have it. And so, so now how can I, how can I look at the value 24? Well, we just, just like we added a dimension, we're just gonna add a layer. And so we need to take a look at, you know, starting with the outer layer, you know, how many items do we have? Well, if you take a look at these, these pink brackets right here, here's one item right there. Then there's another item here. And there's another item there. So when this outer loop, or when we take a look at it, when we start, we're going to take a look at the, the things as a whole. So one of these whole matrix items is now right here. And we're going to just, you know, identify the first layer that we want to drill in. So in this case, we're looking for 24. Well, if we took a look at these right here, we know this is the third layer. And then we're going to try and go in. So we know it's the third layer. And then we want to go in a little deeper and say, okay, well, now it's the, the second the second row. And then in that second row, it's the, it's the third item. So if you take a look at the indexing, the third layer is really index two. And then the second row is index one. And then the last item or the third item is index two. So it's my three dimensional list, two, one, two. And if I run that, I get back my item. And so the layers are oriented, you know, if you take a look at it from the, from the, the, the white side here, we have this first layer and the second layer is behind it and the third layer is there. And then we just access rows at that point after that and then the individual items. And that's how it's all addressed. And then looping through this data and printing it out, we just add another layer to our nesting. And so now we have an outer loop. You know, when we want to loop through this data, we think of the structure as a Rubik's Cube. We have the outer loop going to iterate over the layers one by one. So it's going to, the, the outer loop is going to grab a single layer and take a slice off of this, this Rubik's cube, whether you want to go from the, the top or the, the, the front, it doesn't matter. It's going to take this, take this one slice right here and give that to you as layer. So, you know, you want to think of descriptive names here. We have four layer in my three dimensional list. And then I want to iterate over the rows in that layer for row in layers. So I'm going to grab a row. And then for item in that row, I want to print the item. And so if you take a look at it, this innermost loop is going to iterate over every item for each iteration of the middle loop. And it will run a total of 27 times through. So this loop will completely finish 27 times by the time this one finishes three times. And we can take this and then throw it into um, Python Tutor to see that real quick. All right. Okay, so we instantiate the list and it looks like a hot mess here, you know, because it's gonna try to show you all the nesting is involved and it can it can get quite complicated when you take a look at uh, Python Tutor with this multi-structured data. But, you know, it's not gonna get much more complicated than this. And so now we're gonna go through our loop here. And so we're gonna start with a, a loop there and then we're looking at an entire layer so that it's going to it's going to point to this right here as the entire layer and then uh it's going to keep going in so then for row and layer and then for item and row and then we're finally getting to our first item which is one and then it's going to go up and just iterate over this loop so this this is the only loop that's running right now and they're all running 
but this is the only one that's actively running for every step I take. I'm going to print. And then it's going to go up and go up to the next row inside of this one here. And so you can just follow along with it. It's going to print each item. So four, five, six. And then go back up, iterate to the next the next row. You can see row is just changing each, each uh, row it's changing to. And then finally, that's done. Now it finished every row in that layer. So that, that one layer is done. Now it's going to increment layer by one and go down to this layer now. And this layer has three, three rows in it. And each row has three items. And that's, and this is where when you start adding dimensions onto these, these loops, it grows in complexity logarithmically. So if you add a fourth layer or a fifth layer, you're really going to be pushing your computer, you know, the, the CPU to run through all these loops, especially if each one of these loops had a thousand items, for example. And so all the way through, uh, we can see we just count. We get, go to each row, then go to each item in every layer. It just takes, we notice that outer loop only ran three times. The middle, the middle layer ran nine times, and then that inner loop ran 27 times. Any questions on that, the three-dimensional loop? So you could you could uh rename instead of saying row, you could just put like X or whatever variable. When you do your for loop, so but that's more just for us to like actually know what we're looping, I guess. Right. Okay. Good coding practice. It. Yeah, good coding practice tells you to name it something descriptive that applies to the data. Yeah, but you can name these anything as long as you make sure you match it here. So if like you said you want to name this you know chicken, then here's chicken, and then you know the other one has to be matched down here because you're iterating in that. So. Uh, just make sure they match. But yeah, they can be anything you want. Okay, appreciate it. Yep. Okay, and here we have, uh, you know, we can use those methods with those multi-dimensional lists. We can add using append or extend or insert. You just have to think about where you are in in that, you know, what dimension are you in? You know, how far have you, have you drilled into the, the data? We start appending, right? Uh, here on a two-dimensional list, we're going to re, you know, reassign my matrix. We want to append uh, another row to my matrix. Well, we can do that by just appending and defining our row. If I ran that now, I have four items in my matrix, and the last one being 400, 500, 600. Um, with repra uh, replacing rows and columns, uh, we simply assign the uh, new list to a row index. So we can we can say, hey, if I want to, you know, change out, uh, you know, the 400, 500, 600 uh, at you know my matrix, the index of negative uh, one, to make it more, you know, to make it fit better. If I ran that, I'm replacing the 400, 500, 600 with 10, 11, 12. So I'm I'm just assigning, uh, I'm reassigning that last index. So I'm changing it in place. That's the beauty of lists. Remember, they are mutable, so I can change it. Uh, to change or replace a column, of course, you'll need to use a for loop to iterate through the rows and change the elements. So here I have for i and range and length my matrix. Uh, and then I'm going to go in, and I'm just illustrating different types of loops we have here. Uh, but I'm keeping track of I because I need that for my outer my outer loop referencing. So um, here I'm saying for index and an item and enumerate my matrix the index of I. So I'm I'm going in I'm drilling in and then I'm I'm checking to see if the index is one because I want to change that the the middle column. So uh, if I if I see that, then I'm going to go ahead and change it and multiply it by 100. And if I run that, you can see now 
what it did is that when it found the index of one inside of a inside of a row, it multiplied it by a hundred each one. And I'm going to illustrate this one as well in Python Tutor so y'all can see it. Because it can be a bit daunting at first. So let me define my matrix here. Here we go. Oh, goodness. Let's try that again. Thought I just highlighted. I can just highlight that. There it goes. I don't know what I. <laughs> I highlighted something different. All right. Um, okay, so I have my matrix now defined as this multi-dimensional list. It is a, you know, is a is a single single list that has four items, and each one of those items is a sublist, and then each one of those sublists has three items. So I can visualize this execution, and now I can kind of show what I, what I was explaining here. So I'm first starting a range. I'm using the range uh, loop just to show how I can use, uh, I can just make an interval, you know, with only one thing. So remember the range method, you can give it up to three arguments, but it's mandatory to give it a stop. In this case, my stop is the length of my matrix. So how many items is that? Well, that's a four. So it'd be range four in this example for my matrix. That could change if my matrix was, you know, 100 items long. So I'm using the length of that as my stop. That means I go up to, but I do not include four because remember it goes up to, but not including. And that's okay because I'm starting at zero and the zero indexing will allow me to hit the first one and then one, two, and three. So that, that works for me because it's going up to four in the range. So up to, but not including will give me all the way to the end of my outer list. And so I'm I'm making a making a loop, and then I'm I'm using a for loop, but I'm using the enumerate uh, method. And then what I'm going to do is go over. Uh, I'm going to go over each one of these sub lists with enumerate, and then get the index. So the index and the item. So I'm going to get the the z so when I start iterating over this inner loop, I'm going to hit this one first. So zero and one. I'm going to get the index, which is zero, and the item is one, and then I'm going to check to see if index equals one. Well, the first time it runs, it's not going to equal one. It's going to equal zero. And so it won't run this loop here or this, this uh, block of code. And it will just go back up and get iterate. And then it will see that then I am at index one. And so I'm going to run this and I'm going to take a look. So for index and item, index is zero, item is one. I'm right here in this sub list uh, on this, this index. It's going to check, is index equal to one? No, it's not. So it's not going to run that code. It's going to move on. And it's going to iterate. Now index is one and item is two. So I'm now here in this middle one. Is index equal to one? Yes. Cool. Now I want to find this item again. So my matrix at the index of I, which is zero right now, and then index for this enumerate. So it's really zero one i want to change that i want to reassign it and that's what i'm doing i reassigned it to the number it was times 100 so now it's 200. and we go through check that and then move into i'm going to iterate up once now i is equal to one and then i'm going to do the same thing go in there check the first one that's not it then go in the second one multiply that one by itself times 100. Does that help to see how you, you know, to help visualize these multidimensional loops and how to you know use different types 
this probably isn't the best solution for this, but I wanted to use a variety to show how they work and how you're keeping track of this I. You can't rename it here. You can't put another I, I for index here. If you did, you, you'd make it all wonky. You'd keep reassigning. It would not behave the way you could do that. But then you would have you'd run into conflicts because you'd be reassigning I, and then you'd break the I think you'd break the loop actually. Uh, oh, let me let me change. Uh, that. If you didn't use length, what would happen? Like for for I in range or for for row three or line three. Um, let me go back. Let me change this back actually for now. I'll go back to this. You were asking if you wanted to, if we didn't do that, or what? What were you asking? I was just asking if uh, if if uh, length wasn't in there, so it says range, and you got rid of uh, lid, uh, and it says my matrix. If it was just the range of your matrix, uh, why? What's the difference between adding the length in there? Oh, so. The range, the range method requires numbers. You can't have, you can't have anything else. You can't have like an interval. So I can't put my matrix here. Because that, that doesn't work with range. Um, because it only accepts integers. And the list, the list itself is not an integer, but the length of that list is an integer. So that's why you put length. Okay, got you. And so that just that makes it responsive, right? So basically, I could write this loop, right? And let's say I wanted to add more stuff to my matrix, right? Well, I don't have to change this. It will still do what I want to do as long as it's organized the right way. But I can add more elements without having to change anything with this for loop. Because the length will change, and that's OK, because this is responsive to the length. And that so, makes sense. OK. So I can just add more add more items to this main outer list and it will still run. So what about if you just did for I in my matrix, just doing the range length, my matrix prevents something that otherwise wouldn't. So, well, for, for this purposes, so, so if I did like for item, right. Or not item, let's do for, um, for sub list, <laughs> for sub list in my matrix, right. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem here is when you get down into it, now you need to access the item and change it. How do you do that? So for sub list in my matrix, I'm going to go in and then I'm going to look at the index and item. I mean, I guess I could, I could do that because I can then say for index or for item in, um, no, because I need the index. So I want to change the middle one only. So I want to change the middle one no matter what it is. So I need to somehow keep track of the location of it. And so okay, I could yeah. probably do this so I could, but then I wouldn't know what the, the first number is. Yeah, I'm following now. Yeah, so you wanna keep track of your indexing at that point. So I and range would work, or you could you also do another, you know, you can use another enumerate if you want to, to keep track of that. You just need to make sure you don't say use the same name in the sub. So if I if I did this right here and then range lin my matrix, okay, I think, oh, oh, I did it here, so I need to change that. You start to get really confusing um, because now, like, I'm index here and then index here. Um, let's see what happens. Yeah, see what happens. Like, <laughs> now it's multiplied it twice because it keeps setting, it keeps changing it to one so it's one 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 every time what about what about line six where it said my matrix index index is one of them supposed to be item or no, index would be one so my matrix one one if you're in this block index equals one that means you'll have my matrix yeah. one one <laughs> yeah so it'll only change 
this one <laughs> right here because mm -hmm. that's item one and then one okay. yeah we're going to change it again and we're going to multiply by 100 or now it's at, now it's 1100 and then yep so that's the wrong answer you don't want that <laughs> and so it didn't give you an error but it's also wrong so you, you know you got to be mindful of that so just make sure you use different when you use the when you're defining this temporary variable here just make sure you can't reuse it in the nesting of the loops because then you are going to get conflicts cool any any questions any other questions on that I got I got one more. Uh, maybe we can answer this during the break. But um, if we were to try to like count the amount of zeros in that matrix, um, how would we do that? Like, could you could you count the range of the length, or like, how you would you go mean, about doing that? You want to count the number of zeros in this matrix? Yeah, I was I was working on one of the problems, and I was trying to figure out uh, from from code words like how to how to actually you know, look through a, a a structure and then like count how many variables are in it. So like, you know, I was working with count and like trying to use that. So I was just curious how, how you would do that. Like how would you take like that length of that matrix and then figure out how many ones are in there, like how many twos, like um this is I'm gonna dive into a bit of problem solving, right? So you just gave me a problem, right? So how do how do I solve how many ones are you counting the ones that are also including these numbers here? Yeah, yeah. Or, or it could just be a number. It doesn't have to be something. You know, it could just be like uh, count how many twos are in there. It, and it could just be the, the whole number two. Like, doesn't have to oh, be okay. Like, um, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of want to take a step further, right? So, you know, I know you're probably looking just for numbers, right? But, you know, what if, what if the, I want to know how many actual number twos are, no matter if it's in a 12, a 20, a 20, 222, like how many twos are in this entire thing? Like, how would I, how would I approach that? Um, uh, in this case, you know, my first, I, my first thought is, well, I don't want to treat them as numbers. So I, I would, I would want to cast each item to a string. So then it's a representation numbers and I can easily then go into the strings and find the twos inside of each one. But for your example, um, if I want to find like how many twos are in this, I mean, I would, I would still loop over it and, um, I would, so in this case, for index and range, then my matrix, I would keep that the same. And then uh, here, I would say if item equals two, that's where I would do something, right? So I would I would do something here. What would I do? Well, um, uh, in this case, I want to count how many I how many I have. So I would just make a I make a count variable outside of my loop and then um i would then increment it and then return count at the end it's like that and so yeah because i'm still nesting so i don't have to change any of this because um i'm just nesting into a, a you know a two-dimensional list Let's see what happens. There we go. Counts one. Found one, two. But now let's say let's say we're counting all the twos, no matter what. So I would need to do something else. So I would say um item equals well, I would say if two in string item counts two because I found it there and I found it right there. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks. Yep. So there I use my casting, right? So I took a I took a data type 
it's all numbers, but I just turned it into a string so I can then evaluate it and do something. So now I can do an if in at that point because it's a strings are collections of characters. I'm just turning into a collection of characters at that point, whether it's one item or two items. And then I can then I can do the in, I can do this membership testing at that point. That's that if state using the if statement to help me count that. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna, I'm actually going to use that for a permanent example. I like that. Uh, I like that question. I liked how we can expand on that a bit to kind of show the different data types. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Let's move into other nested data structures and we're we're flying through this lesson which is great because you know we're going to spend a lot of time on this and then we're going to really start diving into like our mini project and some other things so we can start doing some problem solving right so um we typically have the two-dimensional data in nested list and they also call we also call them nested arrays you know if you came over from javascript land uh you know arrays is the the term for a, a collection uh, like a list is Python. But you can nest other data structures into each other depending on the use case. And this next one, um, not, not the English-French dictionary, which we already saw this example, right? We had our English-French dictionary. We had hello and bonjour. And then we say, well, there's another term for hello in the English-French dictionary. And uh, that's salut. So I can, um, I can add that to my... I can add that to my item instead of it just being a single string. Now it needs to be a list. So now it's a list inside of a dictionary. And so um, I have that there. And now if I if I looked at my English French dictionary, I have hello. And then my my hello is the key and my value is this list. And so now if I wanted to access only uh, Salou, how could I do that? How can I access and just get back Salu only? Probably put this first, right? So I want to see English French dictionary and then um, I want to access the key. In this case, the ID kind of gives me a hint so I can do that again, and then um, I can select it. And then if I want to get back to Lou, I just need to use my normal list indexing. So I need to know what type of data it is, the value. But in this case, I know it's a, I know it's a uh, list, and so I can get the 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 item at index one. Or if I know it's the last item in the list, I can always use negative one. Uh, either way. And if I run that, I get back to Lou. So that's how you access items, another way of accessing it. But this time your outer is the, the dictionary and then your value has a list, which could also be nested lists. Um, but let's let's move to a more like realistic example, okay? And this one actually kind of ties into a bit of, you know, database, not really. Uh, this is a, this is just a dictionary, but it kind of has the same behaviors you would have like a, 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 a database where you have like foreign keys accessing or, or referencing other things, other entries. Uh, uh, in this case, we have a data structure that contains all the personnel associated with students. So it's like a school, like a school database, but this is a school, you know, dictionary. And if you look at it, it has a bunch of stuff, right? It has, it looks like it's a dictionary. So it's, if you take a look at these outer, the outer curly braces, the, the you know, line 74 is the end, and then line one is the beginning, right? So school dictionary equals this entire thing. So all the way down, that's what school dictionary equals. And then it looks like we have our first key is person one, two, three, four, five. And that has to be a, a unique, a unique key. So each one of these numbers are going to be unique. And inside of that, so the value for that key is another dictionary. 
So uh, it's a dictionary inside a dictionary. And then each one of these keys is associated with some sort of data type. In this case, I have some Booleans. I have some lists. I have some strings. Um, I have nested lists. I have, I have a list inside of this. So I have I have lots of stuff going on. But it is organized, and there's a way we can we can we can extract data out of it uh, without knowing what else is in in here. In this example, you know, I asked, having access to only the parent info, how could you find out the children's names? Right? And if you look at it as a head, you're like, I don't know, what does this mean? Like, well, the parent is a guardian, so guardian, and I have a boolean for that. So this person here, person one, two, three, four, five which we know is Jim Smith by looking at the key and the value of first name and then, you know, the key last name and uh, the value of Smith. So Jim Smith is a guardian. And if you take a look at some of these other entries, it has like suffix, and then it has, you know, student, a student Boolean, which is false. He's also not a teacher. He's not a teacher. He's not a student. He's just a parent. So he's a guardian. He's got his email, his contact information, his phone. And then, you know, do we have a? Is he in a class? No, he's not in a class because he's not a student. And then here I have children, and it, you know it has these references. It has a big list and person nine four five two three, person two three four five six, and person three four five six seven. So if we were to take a look, we could scour through this and try and find it. What if this list was you know two thousand items long? You wouldn't be able to do that, right? You'd have to be able to. Ask. So if someone were to ask you like, hey. Um, I have a parent named Jim Smith, uh, and, you know, he has some kids. What are his kids' names? You know, or, you know, you could you can go through a teacher, right? But in this case, we have the parent, uh, one, two, three, four, five. How could you find the children, or any parent, really? You know, how could you find out their children's names? And so we can query this dictionary to, to find that information, right? Um, well, number one, you know, let's say we want to find all parents in the dictionary. How can we how can we do that? In this case, there's only one parent because I is for example purposes, but you know, if this item was if this this dictionary was two thousand items long, like how would we be able to find all the parents? Yeah, how God, can... yes. sure. What's that? If guardian is true. Okay. So we need to set up some kind of some kind of loop over the dictionary and go through and then um you know take a look at each each person and then go into guardian and check guardian. So it'd be like, okay, so for item and school dictionary, you know, or for for person and school dictionary, you know, or probably like key value. So key value in person dictionary dot items. And then, you know, the key is going to be person one, two, three, four, five. And then the value is going to equal this dictionary. And so then you can say, if value at the key of guardian is true, then you can go back and get some information and then find the children. You can do that. You can find all the parents that way. So you can loop through this. Uh, in this case, you know, the way, one way I would, I would find it is you know I would take a look and say well for I would I would I'd make a I'd make a, a a bucket if you will to put data so I'd make names equals a list and then I would make a for loop and I would say well um I know this is the only parent so but you know I don't know I don't know his children's name I just have these person person nine four five two three what what are these children's names right so I could say well for for child in school dictionary at the key of person one two three four five which is the parent, and then I can go in and use this other key for children, so I know I'm going to get a list, and then I can say well names I want to go to my names I want to append what what that child's first name and last name is over each child in that person's children key so in the children key has three items so this loop's going to run three times and print their names so let me run this real quick get into memory it's there and so names.append and then i'm going to reference 
school dictionary at the key of child. Because children, the first time it loop, loops, child equals nine person 94523. So it's going to find school dictionary at person 94523, first name. Well, if we can take a look in this list, 94523, first name is Jimmy, last name is Smith. So I get Jimmy Smith, Jimmy and Smith. And then it's going to go to the next child. And the next child will be whatever, two, three, four, five, six. So Kelly Smith and then Robert Smith. And so that's how you get those values there. But let's go a step further. So let's find, without looking at it, now that we know kind of some things, right? Um, let's find out who the teachers are in this, in this dictionary. So let's first find out who the teachers are. How can we approach that? If we take a look at this example here, we have names, right? So we can say maybe teacher. Teachers equals empty list. And then um, I want to see the people in the dictionary first. So I can say for K comma V in school dictionary, school dictionary dot items, because we have to use the items uh, method to see both the key and the value, because that returns the dot items returns a list like object with tuples in it. And the K and the V will be the first item, the second item, and the tuple. So um, let's start here. Let's just say, okay, I want to see what, you know, I want to see the dictionary. I so I want to print, print K. And then so this is the this is the key. And then print, this is the value. And just kind of see what we're going to get. So I run that. OK, so this is the key, and this is the value, first name, blah, blah, blah. So it's, OK, I see the key is, OK, cool. So I have all the people in that, right? Um, let me clear up. It's, OK, so I, I see that. Okay, cool. So now I know I'm iterating over the correct thing, right? So I'm iterating over it. And so now I'm like, okay, well, if V, and this is teacher, but you notice I hit like the quotes and then it gives me what the, it, it, the IDE will read what's inside the dictionary, but here I have teacher, right? So if if v teacher and I can say uh, equals true, or I can just say if v teacher. Um, I want to I want to add so teachers teachers dot append. K, so I'll have my person. So I'll have my, I'll have the key where I can then do other things, right? So that's the first step. I want to get, you know, who who are the teachers in that, in that uh, dictionary of people? And so now I can print, or I can just call it real quick. I can run that. Oh, I have two teachers in there. So I have person three, four, five, six, seven, and person five, six, five, six, six. So let's take a look here. So I have person three, four, five, six, seven, which is here. And uh, let's see, teacher. Okay. Ah, 
So I'm mistaken my stuff. Okay, I'll need to figure that out. Okay, so here I have teacher true, and then I have a person. Okay, I think what I was doing, I was trying to, uh, um, yeah, I was trying to reference a person's like as a student, their teacher being, you know, another another thing. But what I was mainly wanting to do is see who the teacher was. In this case, I have Gertrude Brown as a teacher, so I do need to say if teacher equals true, because that way it will not include it. So that way, so I'm mistaken my little database, but that's fine. So I can run that again, and now. I have five, six, five, six, six. I take a look at it here. Um, now that ends up being the actual teacher. So I have, I know who the teacher is by doing that. And then I can even go further. Um, I can say, uh, I can get the teacher's name by, if I have the key, then I know, I know I can access everything else, right? Because I have, I have the key by going, using this, this looping here, and then I can use that key to access the values, but I also have the values already defined as V. Um, so I could say V, I can do V, and then I can do uh, first name. And I can actually make this a, let's do a string. And I want to inject first name and V at last name. And if if I'm going too fast or anything, please, please speak up because I'm just, I'm just trying to cover this portion here. Then I close my quote. I think that's all I would need to add. You can add a space in there. If I ran that now, let's see. I'm an unmatched, something unmatched. What is unmatched? Boop, boop, boop. Okay, let's see here. F string unmatched open bracket. F. Okay, that's surrounded. Boop, boop. Okay. Maybe I'm not seeing it. Quotation. No. Quotation? No, you're fine. That is weird. Yeah. B. Oh, no, V is a dictionary, right? It's not K, because K is going to be, no, it is going to be K. Let's try that. Nope, still give me an issue. If V is teacher, if it's true, then teachers append. Unmatched open bracket. Closing there. <laughs> oh man. What am I doing wrong? It's probably something I'm just totally forgetting. I do this a lot. It happens to the best of us. So you need the other um identifier. Oh, you know what? Maybe you need that identifier. What's that? You need the other identifier. What do you mean? Um, that's a nested dictionary. So if I go with a V, then I'm in the in the value, and maybe maybe I need to use these quotes instead. That's true. It does do that. Maybe like that. Maybe that'll work. There we go. I got it. Okay. Cool. So it was like quotes, I think, because I was using single quote here and then I had single quote in here. Uh, I think that was messing it up. But um, so I fixed that. And so now, so I'm going into value because the value is this, right? So in this, in, in the case of our teacher, it's this right here. And then I'm going to the first name and last name and grabbing those values. I'm using the key first name, the key last name uh, to get the actual first and last name of the teacher. So if I this was you know a list of a thousand items long, then I can get all the teachers by using this command to get all the teachers in the school. In this case, I only have one teacher. So uh, I'm going to append her name on there.
Any questions on that? And we're going to be solving problems like this uh, with the mini project. So it's really cool. I think you'll like it. Um, with that, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. This is seven o'clock. So we've been going for about an hour. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break and come back. Um, I'll let me pause the recording. All right. Uh, welcome back from the break. Um, before we start talking about the nested, you know, the multidimensional list and other data structures as well. Uh, and then we went into um, looping over them and then using using these multi-tiered data structures to find information about uh, the data structure as a whole. And then during the break, uh, we had some questions on uh, how to make a nested loop work. And we actually ran into a pretty uh, a pretty common problem, especially with folks new new to like this multi-dimensional list. And uh, in the example we had, you know, just like we had with our um, the Rubik's cube problem, we had layer, row, and item. But if you forget to put your layer uh, in the second portion, so in this case, um, if you just ran this three times, then you would just loop over my list. But you have to remember to use the, the layer that you defined in the outer loop inside of the inner loop. So for layer in my list, then you want to say, well, for row in layer. So because you want to make sure you drill down into the data itself. So you want to make sure that's layer here and then for item in row uh, to get the appropriate, uh, the appropriate loop uh, to give you each item inside that multidimensional uh, list. Okay, uh, moving on. Are there any questions again from the lecture last time? I know I'm asking for lots of questions, but uh, it's great when you ask questions because it helps us answer. So like I said before, don't be afraid to pipe up on um, anything that you're running into, even the most basic stuff. You forget what a string is or like, how do I make a comparison, you know, operator? Like, how do I use that again? Uh, please, we will we'll go over it. We'll make sure everybody uh, understands uh, that stuff so we can so we can do these challenges and, and get into Copa Tune. So if you have any questions, please, please, please ask them. I'm going to change this over to a, I'm actually going to add a code block and then change this over there. I think I meant to do that last time. Hmm. The okay, and then I can put that there. So we have our seating chart. Uh, so we have a seating chart. Remember, this is this is a two dimensional list. Uh, this would be like seeing stadium seating, or you know, nowadays, you know, when we go to the movies, you don't have to get there super early to get a good seat in the middle, you just reserve your seat and you look at a chart. And then you select one and then you get it reserved, right? So if we want to reserve uh, seat F here to get to it, we would need to access the multidimensional seating chart by going to index one, which will give us that, for that second row and then the second item, which is F in that row. That's how we would do that. So if I ran this here, and let me go ahead and seating chart, run that again. Now the F is now an X, it's been reserved uh, for us in the movies or theater. Uh, adding rows and columns, let's say we have a sales data set. So here we have a multi-dimensional list showing sales data when the, the this is kind of like the excel sheet i was talking about how you have like your your column names the first row is like the column names and then you have your actual information that pertains to each column uh in the i in the rows below and so if you wanted to add more stuff a new row well we can say well um we have our sales data and we want to add a new row for Charlie. We have our we can define a new variable called you know this list, and it's Charlie, and then it has the sales figures for January, February, March. And then we want to just append new salesperson as an entire entity to sales data. 
So that's what that would do. Then append, remember the difference between append and extend, append will just attach the entire thing as its own item, one item. Then extend, if you if you put an iterable and extend, then it will separate that item and then add it as a new row. So if I use extend here, it would do like Charlie and then another item, 110, 95, and 105. And that's not what I want. I want this whole thing as one entire, I just want to move this, this list right under Bob as a whole list. And let's go ahead and move this to a new block so I don't run it, so we can kind of see it. Sales data. So if I run that, now I've added, try, I've taken this right here and just plopped it right under, right under Bob. So I have that there. But now I want to add new columns. So let's say we're getting to a new month. We want to add a new column for April. We can use a loop for that. So for I and range, the length of sales data. Um, I want to uh, put a zero for the initial value for the last item. So here, if I run this, now I have a zero at the end of every row. So I'm just grabbing a row that I'm just appending. So append always puts something at the very end. I was putting a zero as a placeholder for now. Um, then I can go back and change it if I want to. Uh, you can also write more creative loops to actually, like, if it's the first index, you know, put the month, April, or put whatever you have, uh, and then put zeros. You could do that, too. You can add other steps inside of this loop. In this case, we're just kind of adding a column to our data real quick so we can we can edit it later. Um some practical applications of these lists. So in the real, like when you're actually coding for, for a company or for, you know, an agency or something else, um, you know, there are practical applications for these. The Two-dimensional lists are good for images, games, you know, data tables. That's, I mean, you think of Excel sheet, that's a two-dimensional list. Uh, and, you know, you're gonna be, you know, a CSV. You know, you'll be importing those comma delimited files all the time in <laughs> Python about what you're doing. It's a it's a good way to kind of have a quick object permanence and you can pull some data in and do stuff with it. Uh, um, and then for three-dimensional lists or even more higher up, you can use them for geospatial data science, machine learning applications. Uh, one example I have uh, is I was writing a script. I didn't write the machine learning script, but I had to tinker with it. Um, and you know, it has, you know, it's in a 512 by 512 image, and then it has information for each pixel. And so every single pixel has a value, and then it has four different channels. So it has 512 and then times four. So you have the, you have the, uh, multiple layers of data inside this array to hold information. And then it gets fed into the machine learning algorithm, which then reduces it down uh, to, I think, like a, a four by four square, and then it expands it back up to to see like it does this machine learning magic to evaluate it. I kind of get the skinny of how it worked, and it just it takes these images and pushes it through this this algorithm to 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 look for clouds. In this example, it was like a small image, and it would look for clouds. And then after training it, you know, for fifteen hours, I could get an image, and it would show like clouds in yellow versus no clouds, like normal land and stuff. And it was you know it was really cool to get that thing to run, but uh, it was really neat to see how I was breaking up the, I was tying like these images. I wrote the script to actually take this giant image. It was like, I mean, it was like 20,000 pixels by 15,000 pixels. It was huge. It's like, it was like a giant image. And I had to slice up and use 512 by 512 squares using a script. And then I saved each file. And then that's what we feed into the machine learning, machine learning algorithm to uh, evaluate it. Um, the libraries you can use with these, with nested data in those applications, you're going to come across it all the time. But NumPy and Pandas are huge for that. So Pandas is good for data frames, so big data, uh, and you know, quickly taking, taking, uh, turning, turning something into a data frame, 
and then messing with columns and rows quickly, pandas is great for that. And then uh, NumPy is, is great for data analysis uh, when looking at those multi-dimensional data sets where you don't have to really think about drilling down. They have methods included that will help you visualize and process data quickly. So it's good to take a look at those. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it now, uh, but you can do it, you know, some other time whenever you, you get a more comfortable Python. Take a look at those libraries. It's it's uh, really cool what they can do. Uh, but yeah, that's the end of the formal lecture. So again, it's a short lesson, kind of introduce some new concepts, new way, you know, deeper level thinking when it came, comes to data. But um, what's left? We have these two mini projects. So there's no exercise at the end because uh, we really want you to be focusing on the application, getting it done, getting it submitted. Uh, so Guillermo can take a look, uh, give you feedback, whether good or bad, um, give you the application for the, or give you the schedule for the uh, live coding assessment. And so you can get in. And whether you attend X-Ray or you want to you wanna, uh, wait until Yankee or Zulu, you can do that. You Once you pass the application, you've passed it. You don't have to worry about applying again. So that's something that's uh, that's good for, for y'all. If, you, if you're just not, you know, don't think you're ready to go into X-Ray, that's okay. Yeah, you can still, you can save it. So um, any questions on this lesson at all? Yeah, well, this is a, maybe a little off topic, but I was wondering, do you, in Co-Platoon, do you use um, Seaborn at all? The, what is it? Seaborn. I don't think I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. It's um, it's a way to you um, a preset way to read data frames using NumPy and pandas. Um, I I never did. Um, but I mean that's the beauty of like the final projects. You you could you know you could you could use that library in your project if you need to. Um, but yeah, we never did. And I didn't in Lima. <laughs> that was, a, I mean, it was four years ago. Wow. I was just about to start four years ago. Yeah, crazy. So no, yeah, but you know, there's a lot of folks in their final projects or group projects that will use all sorts of cool libraries. Uh, and they come up with pretty cool stuff. Any other questions? Okay. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's move to the mini project. You know, we can go over this today and tomorrow, uh, and then I have another one as well. But uh, yeah. So for the mini project, this one here, I've I've done a few times for some classes, and it's it's always been good because it really exposes you to all the stuff we've taught uh, really kind of wraps up everything nicely. You know, it, it, you know, we talk about conditional statements. We go over different data types. We we use ordered and unordered data types. We use loops, uh, and so we use some different modules, uh, strings. So um, it's really good. So let's let's take a look at the mini project itself, and then kind of like start doing some like problem solving analysis using that computational thinking. Uh, and you know the problem solving techniques that we have as uh, software engineers to come up with a solution. In this case, we're looking at the Powerball. Uh, the reason I choose this is because, um, well, it's, you know, the Powerball is always like something that's, oh, wow, you know, I can win. I just got to buy a ticket. And as long as you buy a ticket, you, know, you can win. Um, you're not going to win. <laughs> you're, just, you're just not going to win. I mean, if you, yeah, you can't, you can't win if you don't buy a ticket, but your, your best bet, you know, it's a better bet to just never buy a lottery ticket and just invest your money. So, but it's still fun to play. Um, I'm not going to lie. I play it sometimes, you know, if it, if it goes over a billion dollars, I I'll, I'll buy a ticket or I'll, I'll throw 10 bucks at it. Um, but you're not going to win. <laughs> you're not going to win a jackpot. Um, so uh, is everybody here familiar with, the Powerball, at least in a general sense. Um, now, last class, I had a couple that uh, didn't know what it was. I, I had no idea how it works. And so 
Um, and so I have the explanation here. And so it's, you know, it's multi-state. It's, you know, it's very popular, uh, that and Mega Millions. Um, and when you start thinking about, like, the odds, like, when you're looking at these, the, you know, it has, like, this hopper. And it has the balls going up. And then, that you know, one ball comes down. And then it's followed by four more. So you get five white balls. And then it, and then a power ball comes out. And if you think about it, like, those five numbers come from a set of 69. I think they even bumped it up to 70-something white balls, if I'm not mistaken. This was an older description. Uh, and then you have the power ball, which is a completely separate hopper of balls. And then that power ball comes out. And those drawings are held twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And I think they even added one more day, if I'm not mistaken. But to win a jackpot, you have to match basically everything you have to match all those numbers and the powerball to the future drawing and uh it's a one in 292.2 million chance to win that it just doesn't happen um and so you know to keep the allure you have the smaller prizes uh and those have uh significantly better odds of winning but they aren't that much and so tickets are two dollars per play. So you can play. Let's just let's just keep up the rules here. You can play twice a week, and if you want to play just one ticket, which most people don't do, uh, you could just say, "I want to buy a two dollar ticket and get one row of numbers," and that's it. Most people just throw a twenty or whatever, and they'll buy you know either ten numbers, uh, or they'll have like a special set of like numbers that they fill in uh with like birthdays and stuff and so you can start thinking about like odds of winning and numbers to pick you know what are the better numbers to pick you know you you almost want to stay away with from like one two three four five or something like that because other people will guess those and then you'll have to share a jackpot if you happen to win but uh getting back on track that's the that's the powerball and so what we want to do is we want to build a we want to build a Python script that mimics the Powerball. And what I mean by mimic it, mimic it, I mean, I want to establish a ticket. Uh, I want to establish a drawing. I want to compare my ticket to the drawing. Uh, and then I want to determine what I want as a prize if I won a prize um as a baseline i want to build onto that and say okay well not only that but i want to i want to maybe add the option to pick my own numbers and how do i how would i go about doing that or i also want to have a quick pick where it just randomly picks for me and then gives me a ticket and then i want to keep track of my play over you know, we can use Python because Python will go really quickly. It can go over thousands of years if we want to, right? Or maybe I want to track how much money I spent on the Powerball over, you know, a lifetime of drawings and see how much I could win by doing that. Um, and I want to get as close as I can to actually how it works. We're never going to get exactly how it works. We, don't, we can't actually make random numbers with Python. We can make pseudo-random numbers. Uh, but for this case, it's close enough. Um, but yeah, so then we have to think about like, well, how, how can we begin that? Like, where do we start? And we can, we can talk about that. So let's, you know, let's open up the, the floor and we can kind of just talk through how we can do that. And what I'm going to do is I will just make a new cell here and we can maybe start with like Powerball uh powerball pseudocode e s e u d o c o d right yeah and so and maybe not that just let's get our let's get our problem statement our our objectives right so our first objective you know what would be what would be a good a good problem to solve first when we talk about you know the process of the lottery what could we what could we solve? What small problem could we go over first to maybe start this process? Randomizing numbers. What's that? 
I'm sorry, you're really quiet, so it's really hard to hear you. <laughs> Ran randomizing, randomizing numbers. My apologies. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we want to we want to somehow so somehow uh, get random or pseudo random numbers. Okay, cool. So we have that. Uh, then two. What else? What else do we need to think about? Price of ticket. Ah, so getting like an establishing a ticket, right? So making a ticket. Okay. So what is a ticket? You selecting or doing a random of the from the given list of numbers. So what are what are the so how many numbers comprise a ticket? Six in total. So six, six numbers or, total. Yeah. Uh, and we have five main numbers and one Powerball. Okay. And then, so we have to, we have to like make these, we have to make these, this ticket um, and we have to put it in there. Okay. Uh, cool. So we have to, we have to somehow get random numbers like from, from a group of numbers and then put them into this ticket. Okay. Didn't you mention like one through 70 or something like that? Yeah, we'll use one through 69, I think. So it's okay. uh, 69 white balls. So one through 69. And then there's a power ball and it's one through 26. So yeah. So then we can maybe put that as a constraint. So one through 69. And then a power ball is one through 26. Okay. Cool. So we... So we want to get us random numbers and we want to make a ticket and we have six numbers total. Um, okay. So what, what would our ticket look like in Python? How, what would it, what data type should it be? The numbers themselves are going to be integers or floats. Integers. Integers. Yeah. Okay, so ticket numbers are integers. Cool. But, so what about the ticket, ticket itself? Do you want to do a dictionary so you can have selection one through five and then Powerball? Okay. I was thinking tuples. There you go. Would that be bad? What's that? I was thinking tuples. Would that be bad? Tuple? Okay. Yeah. Right, so when you establish a ticket, right, then you can't change it. It's like exactly. A... Uh, so yeah, you have a ticket and you don't want to change it, right? I mean, it really doesn't matter. You can be a list or a, or a tuple. I would say either list or tuple. Um, what about both? Because we got to think about how we're going to put numbers in this list, right? Yeah, I say both. Okay, so start up as a list, build it, and then maybe cast it to a tuple. We can do that. So build build a list of numbers uh, and then, then cast to tuple. That way it's permanent, like it's our ticket, right? And it never changes, even though it really doesn't matter. Like it, it really won't matter at this point because it's maintained the same order. We're going to keep it. Uh, you'll see when we when we get to actually like going through this process, you'll you'll understand. Um, okay, so we have a ticket. We want to build a we build a list of numbers. Okay, so so then we can kind of maybe look at what a you know a ticket looks like. Um, let me change this to actual code because I yeah there we go that looks better. All right, so a ticket will kind of look like this. Let's do ticket equals. So it looked like something like this, right? So like that, and then we can cast it. So maybe we can even just put it in the parentheses. This is what a, a final ticket will look like. And which one's the Powerball? 
last number. Do you want this the the last one to always be the Powerball? Yes. Uh, just any between one and twenty six, or yeah, it's just to be one through twenty six. So I mean, we can start off as a list, so we can add things, and then maybe we can have like, uh, I mean, we let's go back to looking at like how do we get random numbers with Python? Import random. Ah, so the random module. So boom. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to do any coding for that. It's just a random module. I know. It's so awesome. It's like all of it. Yeah, this is a great module to get used to and, and play with. It's fun. Um, okay. So we have our ticket. That's kind of be the structure. Uh, cool. Um, well, I wouldn't think that's you, a um, Wouldn't you just uh, do import random at the uh, above ticket or no? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to comment this out for now. Like, I, I was just kind of just illustrating what kind of, you know, we're going to kind of, we're doing some pseudocode, kind of thinking through this problem. And so we have, we making a ticket kind of is a good, that's a good first step, right? For our problem, we we want to make a ticket for now. Um, And we can just put import random here. So we have import random. So we have that. So now we have, now we have a, a a good selection of methods to use to generate pseudo random numbers, uh, and there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with it. Uh, if you highlight over, I don't know if you it'll give you information on it here, but you can also look at uh, the random module in the Python docs, and it gives some some cool cool information, um, and it'd be perfect for this for this situation. And so, our random. What's that? DIR random. DIR? DIR parentheses random. To show. No, after you import. After the import. Oh, I see. So you're saying here, like, mm -hmm. random. Okay. Like that, right? And then run that. I, what would you mean by that? I'm sorry. Um, what was, was your to show the methods for random? It was what to show the methods for random. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying to show all the methods. Yeah, oh, so you're saying you can do this too random dot, and you can just see a lot of the methods here this way too. So, um, this has a bunch of bunch of ways to see, like you can see choice or you know, gauss, uh, randint, um. My mind to go to because we're really looking at integers. Random is a really good one because it gives you a, a selection of um, numbers and then you specify your ranges. So you can say one to 69, just like that. So my number, my number equals that. Then you can do my num. Uh, let me run Python, and it's uh, number one, 29. A one again, 29, 54, five. So it gives you a random number between the integers you, you choose. I believe this is inclusive, so we want to include our last number in there. So that's how we can get a random number. Okay. So we want to make it. We want to make a ticket. So let's let's explore how we can make that. We can build a ticket. So let's let's start with I guess making an empty ticket. My ticket equals like that. So now I have a ticket, and if I were to print it or look at it, I mean it's nothing exciting. But there's my ticket. It's empty. I need to fill the ticket. So. Bill ticket. How can I fill this ticket up with stuff? Hey, Aaron. Yeah. I was wondering if we might start off with like a conditional um, where we're going to essentially ask if it's a quick pick or if it's a um, 
whatever the opposite of pick pick is. Mm. Uh, the, you, know, just, you select your own. Yeah. So start with that, and then based on because I, I, we're going to have some, we need to have some inputs right from the customer. We do. Uh, so but I we, think. I think right now all we're trying to do is just let's let's start by just making a ticket. Let's see what a ticket looks like and how we can build one. Because what we're going to do this and this is the way we think as a as, as software engineers. We're we're trying to get the most basic process down now, and then wrap it as a function to call, and then we can work on other stuff and call this function whatever we need, and so then we can then build up to getting to quick pick and everything else by running a function, right? So maybe right now we're just we're just trying to see a ticket be filled and actually write some code that we can then wrap into a function, and then put it aside, and then you know perhaps use this functionality for other things as well. But yeah, so we're going to get there because I do want to have, that's one of my goals is, you know, we want to have a ticket. We want to have a drawing. We want to have the ability to do quick pick or, or random right now. We're just going to worry about quick pick for now. And then we can add that functionality later. Um, and then I also want to start tracking how much money we're spending. And I want to, um you know see if we have any good winnings and so we have to look at prizes and everything else and so we have to put all that information into our script but right now i want to focus on just how can we build a ticket how do we fill a ticket how can we use this random library to do that and what tools that we've learned before how what what can we use to fill this ticket because i don't want to do it manually i don't want to put random numbers i don't want to hard code any numbers i want python to do that for me so what would what would be the the most appropriate way to fill a ticket? Well, we had to start doing like indexes and stuff like that. Indexes? Yeah. From like zero, one, two, I'd say four, and then that, you know, even though we're you know, ours is like, you know, one to six, but the index would be like zero to let's see, one, zero, up to like yeah, zero to four, and then mm -hmm. that uh, Powerball ticket uh, index would be added. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a there's something we can use to maybe get like integers, maybe for the indexes to to do that to fill this ticket. So uh, the next would be to create a variable to make the random number. Hmm. Yep. So we need to make we use a variable to kind of create a random number. Jose put us say I would use a for a for loop or like a with a range, and then using the random to create the numbers for me. Right. So he's saying use like a for loop with a the range method because then we can put integers in there, and then we can you know because we'll be counting up, we're starting at zero. We can use that for our indexes, right? So we could say well for i in range and then we can say five so start at zero up to but not including yeah for i in range five um well then how do we get so what we're going to do inside this portion now so we have four i in range five what do i want to do Then you make i equal the random integer. So i is equal to? Mm -hmm. Or maybe like a new variable? Yeah, we can do that. Num equals random dot, we'll do randint. And do one comma 69. Okay, and then uh, we want to put that into my ticket, right? How do I do that? How do I how do I put things into a, a list? Append. Okay, so my ticket dot append none. Okay, then after the loop is done, I go back. I want to go back to the main indentation and just see what my ticket looks like. 
Okay. Wow, looks great. So it is inclusive. So now we know it is inclusive because we have the number 69 there. Uh, the numbers don't have to be in order in the in the in the lottery. You know, if you take a look here, the numbers um, are in order here, but it doesn't. The order doesn't matter. Like as long as you have the number in the list, you're fine. So I have I have that. So I have a ticket with five numbers, but I need a sixth number and I need a Powerball, and I can't use this because this is the main hopper of numbers, right? So I need a separate hopper. And I think, I think I actually just want to start here. Maybe doing like another loop, maybe. Another four loop. Yeah, and this time I don't have to do the range because I'm just doing one, right? So four. Um, I can just say Powerball equals random dot rand int. One comma twenty six, and then my ticket dot append. So do the same thing, right? Powerball. And now take a look. Oh, there we go. I run this. I can just keep running it, and I can get all sorts of lottery tickets. Is that good to go? For the quick pick. Now we got to mystify it. Well, exactly. Put it into a function, make it mm. say amazing things, choose which one to do. You have a repeated number when you randomize. I, I don't believe. Is that allowed? Are okay. they? So in the real Powerball, it's a hopper, right? And the ball is removed. But you could have a Powerball repeat. So you could have a repeat number for a Powerball. So you could have like an 18 here and then another Powerball 18, yes. Because you're a separate hopper. But in the main, in the main one, I don't think you can. I don't think you can have a repeating number. So these first five cannot have repeats. That can't happen. Which is what the tuple is for. Well, I mean, if I cast it as tuple, it would be the same. It would totally be the same. So maybe we need to adjust this a bit. So now we're looking at this and we're like, well, shoot. Um, I don't want the same number. Couldn't you do like an if statement where it compares itself to the previous index? And if it's not, if it is the same, then don't do it. Roll again. The previous index or the, you know, what right. if what if you have 61 here, 20, 14, then another 61 here? It won't match the previous. But index. I mean, before, it, before or after it appends. So like what if I just do a quick membership test of my ticket. So if num in my ticket, like continue do the thing again, or yeah, continue. Yeah, so continue. Because what does continue do? Yeah. It, it it escapes the iteration and starts a new one? Yeah, it just stops. It doesn't stop the loop, but it just, whatever's below it will not happen, and then it'll just go back to the loop. Yeah, so that's good. So um, if there, and then um, otherwise, you can append it. Uh, and I am way too indented, so I'm going to pull that back. There we go. Um, if you notice in VS Code, you can highlight and just hit Shift Tab, and it will tab everything over to the left. And same with some of the IDEs you use online, you can use it too. So that's a quick shortcut. 
So now if number is in my ticket, then continue, don't do anything. But otherwise, append it. That should guarantee I don't have a repeating number. Now, if you think about this mathematically, this doesn't quite match what the real lottery would do because your odds to getting a certain number change when you reduce the numbers of hoppers in the thing. But I think this is a pretty good approximation for now. We can we can we can settle with this as okay, this is close enough. I just know I'm going to get unique numbers in my ticket and we'll move on. So if now if I run this, okay, yep. And then to what happened there for I in range five, good. And Powerball, my ticket, pen Powerball, my ticket. There we go. I think what happened when I just did that, no, it didn't work. I only had five numbers one time and then it, then it didn't do that again. So, no. so this will guarantee that I don't have repeat numbers. You can have repeat numbers here because this is this is fine. This is appending the Powerball, which may match any number below 26 or 26 and below. So that's okay. But these first five definitely should not match. Okay. I think we have a ticket. <laughs> and so now we can just say, well, def, let's say create ticket. And then we're doing that. And then we can just add a quick return statement here. And so what I just did there is I create a function. And I said, hey, I want to create a function. I'm going to call it create ticket. And it doesn't accept any parameters right now. And so that means I can just call it as it is. And then it will create a ticket. Uh, so nothing comes in. So this is the same thing. When you call this, this function now, which I can show you down here, I can print um create ticket and that should do the same thing so now what i'm doing here when i say print create ticket i'm this is my action of pushing the button to create a ticket give me a ticket a quick pick ticket right now just whoop, there's my ticket i push the button and plop out comes the ticket Great. Okay. So that's our function right now. So now we shouldn't have to think about creating a ticket ever again. We just need to call create ticket to get a ticket. It's going to be a list. Oh, we need to change that to a tuple, right? So now my ticket, my ticket equals tuple my ticket. There we go. Now, if I run that, um, hold on. Let's see here. Oh, I got rid of that statement. Uh, create, create ticket. There we go. That's a tuple. Any questions so far over what we've done? Yeah, so doing that tuple, you said that that number can't be changed, right? Or that um, those yeah, indexes, but, index numbers can't be changed? Yeah, these now, via the script, I can't go to here and change uh, a value. For for the purpose of this exercise, it really doesn't have to be a tuple. I mean, it's fine. It, it, it makes sure that it can't be changed. When we do some comparisons, it will always remain the same. And we'd have to completely redefine it and change it. So it does give us a bit of, um, it does give us a bit of, you know, added securities, Will. Uh, and now I can say this here, I can say um, my, my ticket equals create ticket. Ticket. Okay. 
there's my ticket. I can use this ticket later on down there in the code because it's been saved as my ticket. So yeah, we have a tuple now, we have a ticket, we have reusable logic that we can use for other purposes. So we've we've now created a ticket. Uh, and so we've we've basically done all that right there. All done. So what's what's next? So we have we have a ticket. Um, what do you want to do now? Well, do we want to create another like random set of numbers and then to see if they match up? And if and if it does, like, is there like kind of like a, let's say like a quote, like, hey, you made it or you won or a winner, something like that. Mm. Like that uh one challenge we did where it was like, you know, counting from 10 to zero and then blast off. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just just a thought. We so we need to do like a drawing. We need to actually have the drawing, and then when we have that, so let's let's make our next step. Then, uh, so three, make drawing. How do we how do we make hey. the drawing? <clears throat> I would honestly say if you take uh, your function for create ticket and you just change it from create ticket to Powerball drawing, you could change um, some of those variables so it's a Powerball drawing and you could uh, use that as the uh, comparison between create ticket and the Powerball drawing mm -hmm. or my ticket and Powerball drawing. Oh, okay. So maybe not name this create ticket, but like maybe how about just create numbers? And then numbers here. And then So like that. Right. There we go. We have a ticket and we have a drawing. That's done. So we did two things at once by kind of doing the random number generator. And then once you have that, I mean, the drawing is going to be the same thing as the ticket, just a different instance of it, right? So it's just to make it a different variable that's in different a different location in your computer memory. Now you have two different things to compare that happen at two different times, just like the Powerball drawing happens. You print your ticket at one time using a random number generator, and then you compare it to the actual real hopper of balls that come out and get picked, and then you see how well you did. And so in this case, we did terribly. Uh, we didn't match the Powerball, and we have no numbers that matched. So that was a loser ticket. So now the move is we pop this into a while loop as long as they don't match, which may take however long. Yeah, it can take a long time, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the matching piece, too, would be really hard. Like, how do we... So now we're like, we have a ticket we're drawing. Now we want to, like, well, let's, let's, like, do we want to count how many matches we have? Or maybe go another way? So, like, maybe um, let's, like, establish, like, what we can, you know, what are the prizes with Powerball? Like, what are, what are the things that actually win? Do we need to put, you know, get that into our code base? We yeah. can have like a, uh, we can have like a grand prize or or Powerball winner. 
and we just compare the two lists just to determine whether we have a, 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 a grand prize winner. And then from there, we can find if, if assuming we don't have a, grand, a, a Powerball winner, a grand prize winner, we can see if we if, if did someone get. I, I don't know how the game plays, but you know, like if there's no winner, I think you said something about there there are other prizes, and so I don't know how that works. I mean, if you get five of the numbers but not the Powerball, or you get four of the numbers and and the Powerball, I'm not sure how the sub prizes work. Yeah, were you here at the beginning? I know you weren't here at the beginning of the lecture, right, Michael? Yeah, I was, but um, I, I don't know the I don't know how the gameplay the works. Yeah. I, I've never played it. I never played it. Good. Don't don't play it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but we could we we could quickly determine, and that's probably probably what everybody wants to know is: Do we have a grand prize winner? And we can just create a variable called grand prize winner where we compare um, the uh, the players' numbers with the draw the drawing yeah so here's here's the price chart and so oh. like um actually this is like really the this is like with power plays and everything else which are other ways for them to suck more money out of you but you know we have our powerball odds right and so you have to have all five plus the powerball to get the grand prize and your odds are one in 292 million um but you can also win a prize you can win one million dollars if you just match all five without matching the powerball okay and the four numbers plus Powerball is fifty thousand dollars. Four numbers is a hundred bucks, so on and so forth. This gives you your odds of winning. So, like your lowest chance of win just to win the Powerball itself, right? <laughs> is is one in thirty eight point three two, like overall, uh, which is weird because like, like well, there's only twenty six. I don't know how many you actually. Let me see if there's they have the. They may have changed how many Powerballs there are, but, you know, why isn't this a round number anyway? Like, matching one Powerball, like, that should be one in, you know, however many Powerballs there are. But your overall odds are one in 24 because you can win other things other than using the Powerball, which is why these, they all look weird. So, um, I think that's the state's cut. Yeah. You know. Um, the fam. But yeah, so if you take a look at this though, like that's pretty cruddy. Like that's worse than a roulette spin. Like that is worse odds than betting one single number on a roulette wheel. <laughs> and so, because in fact, it's act it's pretty close actually. It's it's there's 38 positions on a roulette wheel. This is worse. It's 38.32. So, <laughs> so you actually have worse odds. And then with a roulette, you get paid thirty-five to one. Um, so that's where the the casino makes their money. But um, this is uh, yeah, this is a pretty good. So we can we can almost like turn this into something that we can track to maybe get to track money because we know that if we match a Powerball, we get four bucks. Mm -hmm. And we know each ticket costs two dollars. So then we can we can maybe track over a you know loop of how many drawings we have uh we can um we can track how much money we spent on the powerball and then how much we won versus how much we lost so yeah we could do that so yeah but the overall gameplay is you you print a ticket and you get the numbers five random numbers in a powerball or if you can pick your own and then you wait for the drawing and then the drawing happens on TV and then you compare it as it happens or just look at the internet the next day and then see what you want. That's the, that's the, the gameplay. So uh, let's take a, let's take a, uh, let's take a five minute break um, and come back. So I'm going to actually step out for a minute.
All right. We still have a few minutes. Ticket generator. There we go. And we actually renamed it. So we use ticket generator to make drawing. So there's the usefulness of functions. So we had a function and we were just able to call it again. So we renamed it to create numbers because that makes more sense if it's more generalized. We used it to create a ticket and to create a drawing. Okay. All right, I think I'm still recording. I don't think I stopped recording. Um, so we can just keep going. All right, so next, what's our next step with this now? Let's just, right now we're just focused on creating a ticket, creating a drawing, and then doing what? Hold the drawing. Compare, compare tickets. Yeah, like compare the results, right? So compare drawing to ticket. So that's that's our next step. That's what we want to do to see if we've won. I mean, that's what we do naturally. We grab it and we compare, right? And when we compare with our eyes, we can see quickly when we're comparing like the ticket, right? So we have our drawing, we can say, oh, day 29, no, 50, no. Okay, cool. So we do even even with our eyes, we kind of do the same thing a computer does. You know, when we're looking at it, we're kind of comparing numbers. Um, so how can we do that? How can we compare? the compare our ticket to the drawing or vice versa what tool should we use do we say like if ticket okay. equals drawing like that So we just want to compare, we want to compare each number or how, I'm just trying to understand why you would start with the, with the Boolean like that. Well, I'm just asking, I'm like, I wouldn't start with a Boolean like this. This would never, ever, I mean, it may, <laughs> like you have a one in, one in 292, you know, million <laughs> chance of it actually happening. <laughs> but yeah, like. So, uh we need to do something else, right? We need to take a look at maybe each number and somehow like see if it's in the other one, right? Yes. Okay, so so evaluate each number and see if it is in the um each number of the ticket. Let's just do of the ticket and see if it's in the drawing. Okay. And what would our tool be to do that? For loop. What's that? So a for loop, a for in. Ah, a for loop, right? Seems like a for loop. So for in or you know some some sort of for loop. Okay. Cool. So we can just get rid of that then, like that, and say 
Um, so for number in my ticket, Okay, so we're looking at when we start this loop, we're going to grab my ticket. So in this case, this is my ticket right here. So I'm going to take a look at the 10. And so what what do I need to say? What do I need to do to compare and see if this 10 is in this drawing? That would be another for loop, correct? Or if, if, if. If. If number. So in in my ticket drawing a uh, drawing yeah okay so then what do I want to do I guess we go back up here like we know that we need to like create like a like a way to keep track yeah I was gonna say store that information in another variable okay and make that variable a list. Okay, so it's like matches or something? Yes. Okay. Use it that way. So matches equals empty list. So if number in drawing, then matches. Um, it's a list. So it has list methods that we would use. Uh, would be a good one. Or a pending. Ah, a pend. I think append will work. And we're going to append what? We're going to append number. Okay. Matches.append number. Okay. Cool. So right now we're looping over it. If it's in there, then we're good. We'll, we'll create it. We'll have matches, right? And so that, that will give us a very basic comparison. So if I ran this now, okay, and then oh, I need to see what number is, right? So number, or not number, matches. Oh, no matches, not really. Now we really can't see anything, right? We don't know if this is working. How can, mm -hmm. how can we see if this is working? Question, Aaron. Yeah. Um, when it comes to methods on list, uh -huh. uh, do they apply to tuples? And given that we can we cast our ticket to a tuple, is is that impacting anything here? Uh, this would not impact. So if we have two tuples, right? We're just looping over the tuples, but we're just getting it. We're assigning number when we run the for loop. So number is its own like entity right uh -huh. and then we're appending it to a list so we can do that because uh -huh. matches dot append so that's not a tuple so we can we can change a list we can't mutate a ticket so um th in this case we're fine now if we try to append something to a tuple it's going to say eh, eh, can't do that you won't even see it turn green i mean if i turn this into a tuple like that and then i try and use a pen see how a pen stop turning that color it's not green anymore because it's not a, a valid method. Okay. So, yeah. So I think I think we're good here. But like this running us right now, I mean, I don't know if we have any matches. Like, is this really working? I have no idea. So maybe we can use like some print statements, something to kind of see where we're at. So maybe we can say, well, let's do print uh num and or number. And then maybe uh, let's print the let's print the ticket up here. So print uh, this is my or better yet, let's do let's print drawing so we can kind of see what what the drawing is, and then we can do drawing. So we're gonna print the drawing and then print the number and see the numbers go through to kind of to kind of to see if this is working, right? Uh, and and so now, you know, at least we know it's evaluating through it. So now we say, this is the number, this is the uh, number, 
in the loop. And then number. Okay. Cool. So now I can run this. So drawing. Okay. So this is this is interesting. So it says drawing 34, 49, 63, blah, blah. And this is the number in the loop. Boop, 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 boop. So the loop is looping over my ticket. It's not looping over drawing. And yeah, it definitely found the 22 matched and it put it in there. Okay. And the 22 was a Powerball, so that's a $4 winner. Yes, it is. Looks like it's, you know, because it's looping over it, so it's the last one. That's good. Oh, that 25. It's a 17 match there. Oh, this is the Powerball, but oh, that's not the Powerball. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, yeah. that doesn't work. It works, but not the right way, right? We need to do something else. We're getting there. But now we're, we're, it looks like we're getting a result, right? We have something in our match. That's good. So what do we need to think of? How can we do that? But now we have to think about, well, if we really think about it, we're doing an evaluation of these first. We need to evaluate these And then evaluate this, just like we created it. We created that with the rain, the loop, and then we just appended the Powerball at the end. I think our comparison could probably be the same process. We first compare these, then take a look at that. Just so we don't mix them up. We don't want, we don't want to compare this to this and say, oh, there's a match, because that's not true. That would not work. You wouldn't win anything there. This is a $0 winner. <laughs> So could you just do four number and range into the first five? Oh, yeah. So like, so maybe do like a slice or something? W would you even have to if you're only iterating over the first five and just stop at six? Or don't oh, I see six? It. So you're saying in range, so range, um, Lynn, the length of my ticket. Um, and then you like maybe minus one. Yeah. And so now this won't be a number, this will be a number of index, right? So for I, so for index, and then we can say uh this is the number in the loop, or from let's say this is the number from the ticket. And this will be now my ticket I. And then if my ticket at the index of I is in drawing, um, matches append my ticket at the index of I. Okay, so now this one, um, this one will not hit the last one because what's the length of my ticket? How many is that? Six. Six, Six right? So this, this, this. If you just and not didn't include that minus one there, length of my ticket would be for I in range six. Um which would give you zero through five, which would cover the entire ticket. We're saying range five. So it'd be zero, one, two, three, four. It'll stop there. So that's what we want. And so we can run that. Okay, so it ran only five times. This is the number in the ticket. I guess I can print ticket too, right? So just to see, um, so ticket, Ticket equals my ticket. There we go. Let's separate this logic a little bit so we can kind of see. Okay. So here, ticket and drawing 
this is the number from ticket 31, 47, 35, 34, 55. Okay, cool. So it went through and it stopped here. That's exactly what we wanted to do. But if you look, oh, weird, look at that. What happened there? That's a problem. I only have five digits here. I don't have a Powerball or anything. What happened? Can you run it again? If I run it again, it'll probably be six again, but there's a reason why this showed up as five. Let's see. The continue. What's that? I think it was the continue. This? Mm -hmm. Right. So when I hit continue, I basically, I have no way to check to see if I have a minimum length of anything. Right. So because I hit the continue, it means I matched the ticket and it just went through again. And because I'm just going to range five, it's still hitting five and saying, we're good. So it, it only gave me four numbers and it gave me a Powerball. <laughs> hey, Aaron, um, earlier you, you, someone wanted you to put a dir random and you said, oh, we could just do random dot just to see the methods that are available to random. Mm -hmm. Can you do that on line three, random dot, just to take a look at the methods? Sure. Now, if you scroll down, see that sample there? Uh-huh. I feel like sample is what we're looking for, because what that will do, mm -hmm. it'll give us some unique, a unique list of numbers based on a range. Okay. So let's see, random dot sample. Python. And we have a geeks for geeks here. And let's command make it bigger. A particular length of list item chosen from sequence. Okay, without replacement. So and that's what we want. No replacement. Aha. Okay. Sweet. So we, that way we can avoid having that without I, writing our own, but we, we could do that. We could still, we can still make this and, you know, write our own where we can always check the, uh, check the uh, length of it to make sure that it's always going to be five. Like we can do a while loop and while, while the length of my ticket is, you know, less than five, stay in the loop and we'll just keep going until it finally adds it. Right. We can do that. Or we can use sample. So let's let's think about that for example. So we have random and sample, and then what do we put in as the argument? We put in two arguments. We put in well, we start with range. So with range, so range, and then range has two arguments, right? Uh, one comma sixty nine or seventy. What do we? I think we want seventy. I think it's up to but not including, right? So range. Mm -hmm. One through 70. Comma and five. We want five, right? Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering if that's what my ticket equals. My ticket equals that. That's our new my ticket variable. Oh, so we'll get rid of all this, right? Uh-huh. Sweet. So right there, we had a problem. We we kind of went to solve it, and we were looking through some issues, and we oh, we run into issues, and we're trying to run down here. Maybe there's a better way to enter. We went back and improved on it. That's we can do that. We totally can do that. So here we would say, actually, and B. like that. And then, um, sweet. So we can then comment, comment off those slides. Pop them down. Boop. And we can still keep the random random for the Powerball, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we don't need this loop at all. Yeah. Maybe we could just comment it out for now. I'm yeah. always hesitant to delete code until 
you know, I feel safe doing so. <laughs> right. Okay, so we can get rid of that here. Um, let's see if can you can you go ahead and yeah, print my ticket just to see if that's what think, we're looking for. I'm gonna comment that out too, just so we can uh um yeah, that should be good. Uh let me get rid of that too. Okay. Oh boy. Oh yeah, I can't do that. I gotta do it this way first. I see. There we go. Let's try it that way first. We'll see what happens. Okay. Drawing and ticket. Yep. Good. And then we can we can after we do that, then we can uh, return. We can return tuple. My ticket. We want to make sure it comes back as a tuple. We don't have to. It's not really, but yeah, we can do that. Okay, so that that works. So we can just boop. And so that's the power of these modules. You gotta go look them up, you know, and, and take a look uh, at, at ways to get a uh, um, a simpler a simpler bit of code. We just we just reduce our code for our function you know, by what, five, six lines and, or even more. Now it's, now it's basically three lines of code in the return statement. So if I run this here, now we have tuples. Now we have a Powerball. Okay. And now it's guaranteed to not repeat. And so we can go back to this now, the comparing, the comparing, right? So. Now we know we're not going to have repeats and we won't have erroneous tickets. It'll always be six items long, five of them being the main drawing or the, the, the main hopper balls. And then we have the power ball at the, as the last one. Um, so we can get back to this comparison. And so we're saying for, for, for I in range of length of my ticket minus one. So we're going to look at the first five. I want to see if my tickets in the drawing and then uh, see if it's there. Uh, we can also, we print our drawing and our ticket. Um, we can see now that we have 25 and 25, we match 25, 25 is in there. Okay. So 50 match there. So it looks like, it looks like it's working. I think there's still a problem with this right here. Do you might see the problem? We're not including the Powerball or? So, well, we're not comparing the Powerball yet, but right now we could still compare our main ticket to the drawing Powerball because we, we're just seeing if it's in drawing as a whole. So we need we need to limit that as well, like we did here with this loop. We cut off the last number. We can do that with slicing, right? We can slice the the tuple. Uh, we're not changing anything. We're just only looking at specific data from it. So in this case, we just want to do a a slice and then not include the last one. So drawing minus one. And what that will do is just it won't it won't compare. So I'm only going to take a look and see at this in the subset of drawing if everything from my ticket, each number of my ticket is in only that that subset. So now we won't ever see the uh and that's a winner for the Powerball. That's a winner for the Powerball. We haven't done the Powerball matching yet. That's easy because all we have to do is just check the last index, see if they match in each one, right? But for the main drawing we now have an appropriate comparison to add to our matches. And so after we're done with that, then we can say, if my ticket at the index of negative one equals drawing, 
at the index of negative one. Uh, matches dot append. And we can do uh, like a special identifier for this or something else. We can we can do um, or we can just we can put the match in there anyway. Um, but let's let's go ahead and just do PB or something like that. Let's just do PB. So now we know if we match the Powerball. You can do a new variable called winnings. And for every win condition we do, we append a cash value per, but that doesn't really matter for the mechanics of it. It's more for fun. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you know, almost like you well, the, the powerball really is a special case, right? If you match it, you can only match a powerball one way, and that is matching the powerball of the drawing with your ticket. So we can almost do that right there, and then maybe have a count of how many matches. So we don't have to actually maybe we don't have to append with the number of the ticket maybe we just need to um maybe append you know we can append a number we can append a boolean um yeah we have we have all sorts of options but let's let's leave it like that for now um There are 33 matched, but that wasn't a Powerball. And then, um, now I can run this till we finally match Powerball, but I, I trust that it'll probably work because we're just doing another if statement and only for Powerball. So we'll, we'll assume it works for now. Um, how could we get it to maybe test a whole bunch of times real quickly? Yeah, I think what we can do probably is um, we have a ticket, right? So we'll 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 create a ticket, but for drawing, maybe we can say uh, drawings uh, equals um, a list, and then we can say for i in range. Let's do a hundred drawings append create numbers. And so we can get rid of that. Then we can print drawing. to see how it looks. Comment that out. And then here, we wanna do a comparison. Let's, let's comment this out just so we can see what we have. So we'll comment this out and get rid of that. We run that. So we have a list of a bunch of drawings, and then we have our ticket. So it's all unique drawings using the, the random module to create these tuples. Awesome. So that's a way we can create a bunch of drawings, maybe to, to look at how many like times we could win the Powerball over so many drawings. So over a year of drawings, so on and so forth. There's there's what? There's 104 drawings. If we if we still use the, I think they do it three times a week, but I think uh, in my promise it's twice a week. So um so 104 drawings a year, because they do it twice a week. So 104 would be a year of drawings. And then if we were to introduce this comparison logic here, 
how can we integrate it into our our list of drawings? So right now we have a list of a bunch of tuples, which are consist of all the drawings for the year. Then we have one ticket that we can compare to them all. So we could do like maybe another loop for drawing in drawings. We can move this down inside the main loop right here. And we can say results equals empty list. And then we can, every time this loop runs, we can just append results, append matches. results. So if we're drawing and drawings, then we get a drawing, and then we can compare the ticket that we have, the, the static ticket, to all the drawings. And then we can append that to a list to see kind of what we have for winners. Um, let me print results here. Let me Just get rid of that so we don't print a whole bunch. Okay, and let me get rid of this. This is a just a status ticket to see how well or that status print message. Okay. Oh goodness, what happened there? <laughs> so it looks like we have something. We have some results, right? So we 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 ran through this loop. Um. Before I continue, how's everybody doing with this? Is everybody seeing my logic flow with what I'm doing? Is anybody lost right now? We're trying to follow along. You're trying to follow along. I'm going to save all this code for you too, so we can we can you know you you can take it um, and you know put it into your own Jupyter notebook to play with. So. You know, we're not going to be, you know, we're going to continue this tomorrow too, because we've already kind of moved into tomorrow's the project after finishing this this advanced data structures lesson. So um we're going to continue this tomorrow because then we're getting close for about 15 minutes till the to the end of the 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 day. So um but yeah, I mean is is anybody have any difficulty following kind of what I'm doing here? Uh all I'm doing right now is just I want to just see if there's any kind of results I see, like any you know variance you know with with how my my script is running. Right now, I'm just creating a gears with the drawings with 104, and I'm appending all these drawings to a a list, and then I'm iterating over that same list I just created to then run my comparisons with my ticket that was generated back here on line nine. So my ticket saved the memory. And then I'm just referencing it back in this in this for loop, this nested for loop, to one loop over each drawing, then grab that drawing and then do the ticket comparison. And then I'm making a new matches list that I'm appending to as I find winners. S matches involve at least one number in a list. A non-match ticket is an empty list. And uh, I'm just seeing something kind of stand out there. I'm seeing one that says Powerball, Powerball, like a whole bunch of Powerballs. And I don't know why that's happening. And we need to figure that out too. Aaron, um, yeah. when, you, when you were test, you wanted to test, I think it was line 23 and 24. Uh -huh. and, and then you, you started to like, you know, like, See if you could test it a couple of times, but you know, like you could do that all night, I guess, and it wouldn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you said, I'm just gonna trust that that works. I, I was wondering if if we could do a while loop and we say, wow, 
my my ticket, you know, index negative one does not equal drawing index negative one, then continue the loop. And and then it would loop until it actually found a situation where we had a like a, a Powerball um mm -hmm. number that that was legit. Like a not not a not a grand prize, but like a single Powerball ticket. Could yeah. we use a while loop just to just to deal with lines twenty three and twenty four? Well, I kind of already tested it with Milo loop, and so that's what's happening here. Okay. And so you see how I, I actually hit it? I hit that logic, and oh, I see. Yeah, and you know why I'm getting this? So this is one result, but it's like PB PB all the way down, right? Uh, the reason that's happening is because I'm still in my loop for the ticket. I mm -hmm. just need to pull this back one. And so now it'll just it'll just loop over the first five numbers, exit the loop, and then do the final check. And it won't it will no longer like basically do it five times. <laughs> that's what happened. Because it what it did was it checked the first number and then check the powerball and the powerball is like yep i'm there a pin powerball and then with the next iteration yep it's there and so just kept adding it over and over and over again to the to the list that's why i end up with five in there okay. and so now that i pulled it back outside of this for loop it'll only do one comparison per ticket can we see that can we run it yeah so there's one and then let me see if I can get one to run where it actually hits a Powerball and a number. Uh, I mean, uh, let's do it this way. Um, I mean, I can do more or I can just keep doing it. I mean, it, it should hit eventually. And it shouldn't be hard to hit either. Um, and that's why the while loop would right now they, yeah. help out. Right? There's Are one. you going to look through more? Yeah, okay. I was going to ask. Because I had to open up my scrollable element to find it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's one there. Um, so it is working now. Uh, and we know it's gonna we know it's gonna work because the way the way it's structured now, we have a for loop, the for loop finishes, checks all those numbers, then checks for the powerball. So um that will work. And so yeah, I eventually when I said that initially, I was like, no, we're gonna go ahead and test it with a with a bigger loop to kind of see where we're at. Uh, and then I when I saw that, I was like, yep, there it is. So um, so yeah, now we have the 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 logic works for um a collection of drawings, which is nice. We can that helps us like test our logic um and just see if it works. And now we have uh we have a a working working logic for a comparison. And so what we can do, you know, I can pull this out here and we can just make this a new um, function. We can make this a new function. So we can say def compare, we just call it compare. And then um, do we need some parameters? my ticket and drawing oh, yep so we do need we do need a we do need two parameters we need two arguments for this function and then what are we going to return if anything matches yep and so we can and my command down. There we go. Expected indented block. That's indented. It's indented. And it's returning. Why are you yelling at me? Yeah. I think. Hmm. Or I think it um, Maybe get uh, oh, coming up. It's, it's right here. Yep. It's right there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's expecting a density block after this colon here. Um, and I don't need that right now because I just want to do a I I want my function to do one thing. And my that one thing is to compare a ticket to a drawing and give me matches, right? 
I can then run a loop to actually call compare with my ticket and drawing on a list of drawings later on down the road. So that's another another function down that we have. We have create numbers, which creates tickets, and we have uh, our compare method. So let me move this one up here out of the way. Cool. So we can almost then just do for drawing and drawings. We can say compare. Or we can say um, we need to have like a results. So we can move results up here. Cut off the R. <laughs> there we go. Uh, results. So we can say results dot pend compare. And that's going to be my ticket and drawing. And then I can take a look at results right here. Let me go ahead and get rid of those. Get rid of that. <laughs> All right. I want to see that. So results. Okay, cool. So now We've built a couple functions. Go back to our, our pseudocode. We we got random numbers. We figured that out. We made a ticket. And not only that, we, we made a drawing by reusing ticket generator. And we wrote a method to compare a drawing to a ticket. And if you take a look at what we've done so far, uh, we've written this function called create numbers. And we put the stuff inside that... Now that we've done it, we don't care about what how it happened. We just know it happens, right? We we wrote it out, we tested it, we get back the, the right thing. For compare, same thing. I don't care what happens inside of it. Python code outside doesn't care. It just wants to give a ticket and a drawing and then get results back. Um, and so now what I'm doing down here is I am creating a bunch of drawings just to do a year's worth of drawings. So we know that there's there's two drawings a week. So that's 52 weeks times two, so 104 drawings. Uh, so I make, so all I'm doing is I'm making a list called drawings and I'm appending the result of create numbers, which gives me a bunch of drawings. And there are a bunch of tuples and a big list. And then I make another loop and I'm saying for each drawing in drawings, uh, I want to make an empty list called results, and I want to append whatever comes back from compare, which is going to be a matches list, right? So it's going to come back, and it's going to append whatever that is to my results. So now I should get a list with lists of results for each drawing. Um, and there's more you can do. You can add some text to kind of make it clear for each drawing, you know, drawing one, and here's here, this one. You can turn it into a dictionary. And you can make it that way. There's all sorts of things you can you can manipulate data, and we're going to do that uh, in um, Wednesday's meeting. So when we have our you know that we're going to go dive right into it and kind of finish this Powerball uh, thing up and refine it and see how well we can do. So let's see what happens when I run this. Um, ooh, I got back that, so that's not right. I should be getting back a bunch of results, right? what happened. So for drawing and drawings, drawings is going to be a bunch of a bunch of stuff and I can print it right here. And I run that. So I do have drawings. And then for each one, 
Oh, I'm making a new one. I don't want to do that. I want to put results up here. It's just giving me the last one and then saying, yep, there's your results. I do want to put results up here. That's what happened. Okay, and so now it's going to append to results and won't erase itself after every iteration of the loop. So there we go. So what I'm doing is I'm calling these functions. I don't care what happens inside of here. I just want to get a result back. So I don't have to think about now that I've defined my function compare. I defined it here with my parameters. I, I wrote the what I want the function to do inside. And then once I once I wrote you know the return statement and I, I verified that's what I want to get back, you know, now when I call it, I don't have to think about what's going on there. I just do my comparisons. I can always call compare to compare a ticket to a drawing. And then, you know, right now we only have randomly created tickets. We still need to create, you know, a ticket that a user wants to fill in with their own numbers. You know, that's going to be a whole bear of a process because now we're going to be looking at user input and, you know, making sure that, um, making sure that that's going to be clean data coming in. Have a good one, Thomas. And we also have to figure out like how many tickets does the person want to buy and, and, and track how much they're spending. And yep. So we still have um, a lot to do, but we're yeah. already, we already have, you know, at least the, the basics, right. Of, okay, cool. We're getting results from these drawings and we're seeing, we're seeing, you know, matches. So Aaron um, results is a list with 104 sub list in it. Okay. The results of each drawing, and it's just a number, whatever number matched from that, those tickets are thrown in there. And if you see a PB, then a parallel matched. Yep. It looks like 55 and 49 are popular numbers. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? Well, I mean, you're going to see the same numbers repeating because my ticket doesn't change. Oh, yeah. So you're yeah. only going to see five, you should only see five different numbers in here, right? So 10, 11, 64. 23 and 20. Yep. And then Powerball. Yep. Oh, that's a terrible run of luck. Man. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to Venmo you $3 as soon as you can get a, a list with three, with three items in it. <laughs> yeah. So you'll find like, we're going to run this. I, I've built this several, you know, several times, built different iterations of this, you know, lottery simulator, um, and uh, I'll run it like, I mean, if we want, we can bump this number up to, oh, I don't know, 20 million. In fact, I mean, before we go, I mean, I know it's already past nine, uh, but let's say, for example, um, if if there's a winner. Right. So if if Lynn, well, let me just say if Lynn uh is more than four. So right here. So if if Lynn matches is greater than three. Break. Uh just print something. Yeah, or break. Yeah. Break. Let's do print something first. Print. Let's try. Print winner or something. I don't know. Print winner. Uh, win, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So there we go. So winner, winner, chicken dinner and break. Uh, well, I'm not breaking anything. Um, I'm actually just checking. So I should see something happen. Um, and I don't want to print all of my other things, right? Which I don't think I am. I am printing the results and get rid of that. It didn't like the break because it was in an if statement, but could you put a break on line 18? Um, pushing line 18 down and and a new a new line 18? Well, I'm, line not a, I'm not in a loop there. I would have to put it in here. So... Yeah, I would have to, um, if Lynn, so I can say, uh, uh, 
match matches equals this. If Lin matches is greater than three, I actually could have just copied over this or done this. There we go. And then break this loop. There we go. Better work. And I can even print uh, print matches. There we go. That should work because I'm now doing that, and then I can um, I can just ignore this because I just want to run it, you know, twenty million times. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there it is. <laughs> um, I should have gotten something matching by then, so I may have an error. But yeah, anyway, you can do that that way. Um, Aaron, you said you were going to share this code with us. Um, yep. Are you? How are you going to do that? You're going to put that in Slack? Yeah, I can store it in Slack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll stop here. You know, there's many ways we can go. I've built this thing several times. You know, uh, several different ways. So, um, you know, using different different ways to loop through things. So there's there's a hundred different ways you can build this, but you know, this participation is good. I think you know, hopefully this helps you kind of put some of this coding stuff together. And how you know when you're thinking about the 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 mindset you have when you're when you're building uh, a function like and you know going back and iterating over it and looking at how you can make it simpler. You know that's that's the key, and it's. Um, it's a skill that's developed over time. So just keep keep pushing at it and uh, uh, you know keep trying and get those challenges done in the, in the part two so you can get into Copatoon. I think that's the that's the biggest goal for this this course. So uh, we'll call it we'll call it quits for tonight and then we'll be back Wednesday and Thursday for the finish up this mini project and then the next mini project we have uh, or something else we want to do. It doesn't have to be this stuff, but we'll. We'll make sure that uh, you know we get good exposure into all these these ways to manipulate data and uh, create these create these little projects. So, with that, I think everybody should have a good night. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Good night. Have a good evening. Yep. Aaron, can I uh, run something by you before we leave? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um. Anyway. Uh. I, I decided to go ahead and, and take a look at part two that. Coder bite or whatever you call it, uh -huh. and um, and I was a bit blown away by the first question. I was definitely blown away by the second question. And so, you know, I know this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I feel like you know, like we're learning algebra here, which to me is super important. Mm -hmm. um, but that we're we're being almost tested in calculus um the the level of the questions to me I, maybe i the first two questions i don't know if it's random you know or if th those were the easy ones but um you know all of a sudden i felt like oh you know what I, i'm not prepared for this and um so anyway just wanted to give you my experience on that and you know i know that chad said that a good way to prepare for especially like the the live um assessment mm -hmm. is to do a whole bunch of um cold wars right and i'm thinking he's probably thinking level six maybe level five even um and so you know when you said on thursday you know like you know we can do oh, we can do a couple different things 
I'm, I'm wondering if we might do um, like an eight Cold Wars problem and then a seven and then a, maybe a six and then a five, just, you know, together as a, a Well, I can tell you, we won't have enough, like, we won't be able to get four of those done. And, uh, you know, a level five can get hairy. Pretty hairy, yeah. It's... Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I, I almost feel like the problems in Coderite, having only seen two, that they're, they're more level, I don't know, they're more like level six problems maybe than, than eight or seven. Chad, what, what do you think? Um, um, I actually, I had the exact same experience. So I, I did the kind of the, the self-taught intro to coding for JavaScript. And I went through everything and I totally got everything. I'm like, okay, I got this. And I went to go do the first problem. And I was like, whoa, what yeah. is I, I exactly? I like, I, I think how you said it was right. Um, but what I, I did was I just went and did a ton of code work. It just takes a lot, a lot, a lot. Did you do, um, did you do sevens and sixes or? Um, I eventually got up to sixes and then I would maybe try a couple of fives, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I think eights through sixes, um, you know, and then I, I went back and I remember seeing that first problem again. I'm like, oh, that's so easy now, <laughs> you know, right. it's just because yeah. I literally did like hundreds and yeah. like the eights are very, very basic easy. You know, yeah. for me. Yeah. I mean, but it's just getting that muscle memory yeah. and writing code. That's yeah. is that really, really helped. So to me, it's like training for a marathon, right? The, the eights are like the five K's. Yeah. And then the, the sevens are like 10 K's and maybe the sixes are like half marathons. And I don't even need, think I need to bother with the fives, you know. You know, you know. I also like. I'm telling you, like, what we're doing with with these mini projects is we're we're solving those those problems you're going to see in the seven eights by like writing a function to fix something, and we're yeah. making it bigger. What we're doing is, you know, really what you want to focus on is, you know, those those four things that he talked about are the those are the biggest things. Because those are going to be basically right. we break down any code to even the code I do now on my job, like yeah. I can do everything using those four techniques. Right. So, okay. So, gonna, and, and I, I think, think it's also but, really important that you just pseudo code. You know what yeah. is the problem? Yeah. What needs to happen, and how do you get there? You know, it's like okay, so I got this information. It's really just manipulating data that's all you're doing you know yeah. and sometimes you have to go left to go right <laughs> and yeah. you know you can't maybe go a direct line from this kind of data but you can change it to this data which then you can change into this kind of data you know so you're always just kind of manipulating data so if you're always kind of think of it that way that might yeah. also help so it's just using all these different tools that you've learned over the last couple of weeks now you know how can i maybe use this turn it into this, which I know then I can turn it into this, which is what they want in this problem. So that's how I kind of like to think of it a little bit, but yeah, just the, the big thing for me was just doing it. You have to, you have to do a lot of this code. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I haven't been doing it, but I'm now I'm just going to live on cold wars, but I, I think some good advice that I got was that, you know, when, when you first look at the problem, focus on the problem, don't focus on the solution. Focus on the problem. Spend a couple of minutes just focusing on the problem itself. Don't even think about the solution. And the solution hopefully will, will, will be made easier. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Have a good one. Good night.